All right, welcome back to WordCamp Boston. I hope everybody had an amazing lunch. I ate quite a great mine. And I'm going to be continuing to drink my soda pop through this so that I don't lose my voice. Today we're going to be talking about PHP unit testing. Uh, my name is Eric Mann. I'm a senior web engineer with a company called Tina. We actually sponsor lunch, so if you guys have a chance after you're done with this talk, thank you. go ahead and swing by our table over in the lobby. We are always hiring talent, talented engineers, talented developers, designers, pretty much anybody who likes WordPress and likes open source, come and talk to us. We might have a good opportunity for you. I'll be somewhere around if you want to talk to me individually after this talk if you have more questions about unit testing. The first question that we had actually started before this talk and somebody was asking me what we were going to cover. And I just wanted to take a second to actually explain what we are going to cover and explain why this is the right room for you or if it's not to give you an opportunity to make a quick exit. Unit testing is all about making sure that your code is clean and concise. If you write any PHP code, whether you are a plugin developer, a theme developer, or just a site administrator, if you have ever written the word function or open bracket question mark PHP, if you've ever written either one of those, you need to know what unit testing is. If you don't ever write any of those two things, you can leave now. I'm not going to be offended. It's perfectly OK. But we're going to talk about a few things today, like why you should even bother doing unit tests, some best practices for how you can actually do unit testing, different things you need to be aware of as you write your code and as you write your tests. I'll cover a few tools and tricks that you can actually use to make your testing move more quickly and more smoothly, specifically within a WordPress and PHP environment. Then I'll actually work through a practical example to show you how you can actually approach a unit test. Now the first question everybody always asks me is, what do I test? It's not part of the agenda, it's just something that we need to cover. Because everybody immediately starts saying, well, I need to test WordPress, I need to make sure that WP head works, I need to make sure that WP and QScript works. Let me tell you right now, this is not what this talk is about. You do not need to test WordPress, unless you are writing WordPress core code. If you're writing core WordPress code, that's a completely different talk. There's a different test suite, which I will get into when we get into some of the tools. But we're only talking about testing your code, the code that you're writing for your own site, for your client, for the plugins you're going to distribute, or the theme that you're going to sell and make a million dollars to give you 10%. <coughs> so why do you want to test? Everybody is always asking me, why would I take all of this time to write more code before I ship my product? If you're writing code, you usually spend a couple of hours putting all of this effort into writing your code, making sure it looks good, making sure it works, the browser doesn't turn white when you turn on your website, why would I want to waste even more time writing code? Writing unit test code helps you verify that your code does what you say it does. This might not make too much sense while you're writing code. You're like, well, I'm writing this great function. I know exactly what this function does. That's great. The guy next to you, not going to have a clue when he looks at your code. Three years from now, when your client says, I think this is broken, can you fix this function? You're going to look at that and say, wow, whoever wrote this code was an idiot. I have no idea what it does. I do that on a daily basis. So writing tests is actually a great way to not just verify that your function does what you say it does, but also to document what your function does and how it does its magic. This is where you get into documenting code behavior. How many times have you looked at a function, and the function name is something like, do this? You look at that and say, I have no idea what that does. I once worked at a company where half of the functions were named by a Star Trek fan and were all called Make It So. No documentation. Nobody knew what any of the functions did. We had an entire class that was 2,000 lines long. All of the function names were named after Star Trek characters. We still don't know what the class does, but we can't delete it because it would break the product. So writing your tests makes it easy for another developer, or maybe you a couple of weeks from now, to look at the test and say, well, this function says that it's going to get post URL from ID. Well, what, what is that going to do? You can look at the test and say, okay, it has to do this, it has to do this, it has to do this. You can actually read through your test as a way of documenting your code, documenting what it is supposed to do, and kind of how it's supposed to do that. If you have ever written a line of code, I guarantee you have written a bug. If anybody here writes bug-free code, I want to reiterate, Tenup is always looking for talented developers, <laughs> and we will be out in the lobby after this. But if you don't write bug-free code, you're going to have customers reporting bugs. You're going to have other developers reporting debt bugs. You're going to have quality assurance engineers saying that you don't know what you're doing because you keep writing bugs. When you have unit testing, this is a great way to prevent bugs from creeping back into your project. 
What you do is you take the code and you write a test that triggers the bug. A good example is I wrote a user creation function at a previous company. It worked wonderfully as long as you put in your email address as an email address. You could also put in your email address as drop table users. And that would break the website. It was just something that I didn't foresee because I trusted all of my coworkers to not try to do malicious things when they were using my code. The quality assurance engineer, that was the very first thing he did. So I wrote a test that would attempt to insert drop table users as an email address. And the test expected that to fail. It expected my code to spit out an error and say, you can't use SQL injection. Well, obviously, the state of my code, I ran the test, the test failed. Then I took my code and rewrote it until the test passed. Now that I have a passing unit test, I know that nobody can reproduce that error ever again. And three years from now, as I continue to make changes to the code base, that error is never going to pop back up. So some best practices, just some things that you need to keep in mind as you're writing your, your unit test. There are different things that you're going to be focusing on, uh, different concepts in PHP that you're going to deal with. These are just a few that we're going to kind of address one at a time. If anybody has looked too deeply into WordPress, you've noticed that we like to use the global keyword everywhere. There's global post, global WP query, global everything. Globals, I hate globals. Globals are really ugly and they make it really hard to test your code. They allow you to make a function spread its scope beyond the boundaries of the function. You can have a function that is supposed to do nothing except for spit out a permalink on a page. Well, this calling global WP query to figure out the ID of the post you just queried, it can now edit everything else in WP query, change your post count, anything you want. So once you start saying, I'm going to reference a global variable, you're basically sitting in a sandbox by yourself trying to talk to the president and make him do something too. You're trying to reach outside of the scope of where you are actually allowed to function. Namespaces are something that's newer in PHP 5.3. If you're writing code for general release in WordPress, like a theme or a plugin that's going to be on WordPress.org, you shouldn't really be using namespaces because namespaces are only in PHP 5.3 and above, and WordPress's minimum requirement is PHP 5.2. So if you start using namespaces, it will be great. You can avoid using globals because you can start namespacing all of your functionality. You can have a My Cool plugin namespace, and then everything in your plugin is in your little sandbox that doesn't hurt the rest of the world. But then if somebody else installs that on their mom and pop bakery website and everything breaks, you're going to get a nasty phone call at 3 in the morning. So namespaces are a great way to protect yourself from global functionality if you're doing something that's in-house. If you're working on your own theme for your site, a plugin for your site, or on a client project for a specific server environment that you control and you can determine which version of PHP is installed. Singletons is a class pattern that is used in object-oriented programming to create an object that is only ever created once and that everybody can reference it, kind of like a global, but it's not really a global. I've gotten a lot of flack for saying that singletons are cool in WordPress, and I'm perfectly willing to debate that with anybody who cares later. But singletons, namespaces, and globals are three things that you don't necessarily want to use in publicly released WordPress code because they can all introduce hidden dependencies. Once you have a global that's referenced inside a function, if it's not declared, but, but let me step back. If you have a function and you're looking at a function, you can see the name of the function and what parameters it accepts. You can have, like the WordPress function, the title, get the title, can accept a post parameter, which can be either a post object or a post ID. Inside get the title, it calls get post. If you didn't pass in, an ID or a post object, it will try to get the current post from the global post object. This is something that you can't predict. And if you're trying to write a unit test against get, get the title, you're trying to test something with this global scope and you have all of these things that you are trying to test that you can't see as the developer. So once you start using globals in your code, you're basically introducing things into your code no other developer can see. It might make perfect sense to you when you use it, but then when, when the next developer comes in and actually tries to test your code, they'll look at that and throw their hands up because they won't know where you're getting your data from. Singletons can do very much the same thing because singletons are incredibly difficult to test. They can be tested, which is something I'm perfectly happy to discuss with anybody after this, but that's kind of a beyond the scope of this particular talk. So this 
is just a, a typical function that's going to show some of the best practices that we want to avoid. You can see I'm using a couple of different things here. I'm using global. Globals are bad. WPDB could actually be the WPDB object that we have inside WordPress. It could also be null. It could also be an array. It could be anything that anybody else wants to do with it. And inside this function, I could also assign something else entirely to WPDB. If you're on a regular WordPress page, you have the loop, which has the single WP query object. Well, I might be using global WP query and then assigning my own WP query. I've now broken the site for everybody else. Every other piece of code is going to fire after my piece of code. I'm also using a super global, which is a special class of globals in PHP that allow you to access server parameters, post parameters, get parameters. Any of the funny things you see after the question mark when you go to a URL are going to be inside post. Post and global, oh, get is going to be the ones with the question mark. I'm sorry, post is going to be a little bit more hidden than that. But my point is that both the globals and the post super global are introducing hidden dependencies into this function. If all that you have as the developer to write a test is the name of the function and a description of what the function does, you won't know that it's referencing the global WPDB object. You won't know that it's referencing the super global post object. And you're going to start trying to test something and your tests are going to break because your function is depending on things that you don't know about. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about singletons because this kind of bleeds into our discussion on state. The web, or at least the goal of the web, is to have a stateless system. The idea is you can have a server sitting somewhere in the cloud and every time you talk to that, you create a new request, the server doesn't know anything about you. There is no state. There is no concept of what state the server is in. Once you start introducing things like globals and singletons, you have state. I can talk to somebody here in the front row, then I can go away, then I can talk to him again. He says, hi, I know who you are, that's great, Here, here's the thing you just asked for. That's the concept of state. Because I might be coming back to him and I might just look like me, I could be somebody completely different and now he's giving me information that I haven't asked for. State is just something that you're going to have to be aware of inside your applications. Every time you use a global, you're introducing state. There's some sort of persistence outside the scope of your function. You call your function, it does its magic, and then it leaves a dirty trail behind that other functions are going to be impacted by. Singletons, because they can only be instantiated once, and they can carry internal state, I can have a function that interacts with the singleton and does something. You could then have a function that interacts with the same singleton and does something else. And then you could try to interact with the singleton, but you're not, you don't know that either one of us inter have interacted with it. So you're expecting it to be a brand new singleton with no state, and it's not. It's already dirty because other people have talked to it. This also comes up a lot in caching. If anybody's worked in a distributed web environment, you want to deal with caching so that you don't have 50,000 users querying your database every time they load a page. A lot of us are using Mimcache. Some people are using Redis. Some people use APC, which is built in with PHP. Some people are using the Nginx cache that's built into Nginx. The idea of a cache is basically just letting the web, the website, remember that you've already looked for data. So when you go to the home page, rather than running a new query and pulling up the 10 latest posts, it looks in the cache and says, well, I've already got the 10 latest posts. Here they are. I don't have to connect to the database anymore. This is great. It's hugely performant for websites. It's what makes websites like WordPress.com run really fast. If anybody went to the jQuery presentation earlier today, this is how the jQuery entire network of 20 websites is able to run on a single web server and still serve over a million page views a day, is thanks to caching. At the same time, caching introduces state. When you go and interact with the server and you request and you're expecting it to be a clean slate, the server doesn't know anything about you, it's a lie. The server already knows who you are, the server already knows you've made a request. And once you have this kind of stateful request, you have all of these different things that creep into your program, that creep into your tests, they're going to cause significant problems when you're trying to verify that your code functions the way it does. Because ideally, you should be able to run your tests in any order. You can have test one, test two, test three. If test one leaves a dirty state behind that test two is then depending on, well, that'll work if you run test one, then test two, then test three. But what if you try to run test three, then test two, then test one? They'll fail. You have all of these things happen just because you have this dirty slate that's left behind that you haven't cleaned up after yourself. So here's an example of a singleton, just to kind of illustrate this, this point of state. 
for people who aren't too familiar with PHP, you can have a class, which is an object. It's basically a thing in code that does something. And that's intentionally ambiguous because a class could be anything. It can be the database object in WordPress. It can be a post. It can be a comment. It can be the request that you have made to the server. A class or an object can be anything. It does something because the object can do anything the developer wants it to do. In this case, our class doesn't really do much. We have one function you can call called getData that's going to return this internal variable. You can't get to this variable anywhere else except by calling getData. But internally, the dot 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 at the top of the function means that there could be another function that sets data. Data could be an array and you have a function that allows you to add items to the array. Well, if you're trying to test this, and once again you have test A accesses this single pin and tries to verify that the data array is empty, that's great. Test 2 then adds items to the array and verifies that they're added. That's great. Well, now run test 2 before test 1. This data variable doesn't go anywhere. So you run test 2 and you add a bunch of stuff to this array. There's no method here to re remove the things from the array. You run test 1, which is trying to verify that the array is empty, and it's going to fail, it's going to explode, kitten will die, and you will have an awful time explaining why your site broke to your supervisor. When you're dealing with dependencies in your code, you're always going to have functions that are talking to other functions. You're going to have objects that are talking to other objects. And these are dependencies inside your code. I'm saying don't use singletons, don't use globals. But the fact of the matter is you will use singletons, you will use globals, you will use all of these things that I'm telling you are against best practices to use. And that's OK as long as you use them sparingly. The idea is to document what you're using so that when the next developer comes along, they know what you did. They know why you did it, and they can actually test it because they know exactly how you implemented your, your functions. If you want to get really hardcore into PHP, you can start dealing with interfaces, which is basically taking a class or an object, taking out all of the business logic. So everything inside a function that does its magic, and just kind of lists out this object has this function, this function, this function, this function, and this is what they look like. Interfaces are kind of heavy-handed in PHP, so I'm not going to recommend it as a best practice. Just work on looking at function signatures. And I'm going to show you a function signature just to kind of give you an idea what it is. So this is just a function, and you can see there's nothing in it. It's an empty function. This is actually what a function would look like if you were inside a PHP interface. There is no body to the function. There is no implementation. All you can see is the function name and the values it takes in. And you have all of this documentation that explains what the function does. This function obviously does something awesome. And then it uses the get post function, the WP list plug function. And everybody in WordPress has seen a do action call or an add action call. This one uses do action to call awesome, passing in a post ID. The parameter post is also defined as either an integer for a post ID or a WP post object so that you know what's, what you're looking at. As a developer, this is all you need to see to write a test for this function. Well, probably more than just a function that does something awesome, but once you see the description of the function, you can write a test to say, does this function actually do what the developer said it does in the documentation? If it doesn't, then you send it back to the developer and go and write some more copy while they fix it. If it passes the test, then you're fine. You can move on to the next test. You should not have any functionality inside your code that is not documented. If you do, you need to take a couple of days and go back and document your code. And this I am going to say is a huge best practice because I guarantee you, as obvious as you think, make it so, we see seen today, five years from now when another developer has to come along and support your code, they're not going to know what you were talking about, what series of Star Trek you were watching, and they're not going to recognize any of your witticisms in code. It's just not going to make any sense. Or after you get over the flu, you aren't going to recognize what you were writing when you were sick. This has happened several times, and I've actually seen developers waste weeks trying to go back and redocument code that they wrote when they were on vacation after they'd just gone to an awesome seminar and seen these cool new techniques. They wrote all of this awesome code, didn't document it, and you're then left with a support nightmare because you have to go in and add features or fix bugs, and you don't know what the code is supposed to do in the first place. Look at the doc blocks. From the doc blocks, write tests. If you need to add functionality to the code, add a description of that functionality in the doc block. Once again, nothing should live in the function if it's not also defined in the documentation. So now we're going to take 
a time to talk about tools. How you can actually implement unit testing in your own development practices. The first tool I'm going to talk about is PHP Unit. It is kind of the standard unit testing system for PHP. It's what the WordPress unit testing framework uses. It's what I use in my development. If you're writing JavaScript code, there are JavaScript unit test frameworks and things like that as well. But PHP unit is kind of the big thing for PHP. So this is an example. It's kind of a, a convoluted example of unit tests. It's an object called Boston test. It's going to extend just a helper class PHP unit framework test case. You define your test. We're going to test that TINF has a presence at WordCamp Boston. We're going to define that somebody has to have a presence of at least five to be considered awesome. Then we're going to count how many TINF speakers there are at WordCamp Boston. And we're going to assert that TINF is awesome because we have at least five speakers at the conference. This is, like I said, it's a really convoluted example of a unit test. You can have anything going through and verifying that a post is inserted. And you can verify that a post has certain properties to it. You might have a function that's supposed to get custom post data that you're going to display in your, your news team. You can have a, a test that tests that that custom post data is actually set properly. You can test everything about your theme, everything about your plugin. The next tool is one that we have built internally at TinUp that we use quite extensively for our unit testing. It's called WP Mock. I wrote it in partnership with this guy. And it is open source on GitHub. So if anybody wants to use it, they can use it on GitHub. The point of WP Mock is just to kind of reiterate that we're not here testing WordPress. You're testing your code, your theme, your plugin, your custom development code. WordPress core is already tested. Don't worry about testing WordPress core. A good analogy would be to think of people who do safety testing for cars. You're going to do safety testing for cars. You're going to test that the airbags deploy. You're going to test that the front end crumples at the right rate. You're going to test that the engine drops and doesn't come back into the passenger compartment. You're not going to test Newton's laws of physics. You're not going to test special relativity. You're not going to test friction. You're not going to test all of these laws of physics that exist in order for the car to actually be a car. You're not going to have to test WordPress to make sure that your plugin actually operates. WordPress is tested. Don't worry about it. WP Mock allows you to test your plugin without even running WordPress. The idea of mocking is the idea of taking an API or any sort of an abstract framework that you have to work with. So for example, add action, add filter, do action, do filter, WP head, WP Q scripts. Taking this API and mocking it. Not mocking it as in making fun of it, but mocking it as in creating functional alternatives to allow you to write code that calls these functions without actually calling these functions. So with WP Mock, we can actually take an entire theme built for WordPress and test the theme without testing WordPress. We actually set up our environment so that you have WP Mock and the theme installed side by side. WordPress is not even on the computer doing the tests. There is no MySQL, there is no database, there is no WordPress at all, and we can test that all of the functions we say we're calling in our functional definitions, our documentation, are actually called in the order that we say they're going to be called. They're called by the function we say are going to call them, and they return the data we say they're going to return. All of this without even loading WordPress at all. You can also mock your own API if you are building a WordPress plugin that integrates with MailChimp, for example. You can mock MailChimp's API in addition to WordPress's API. And that way you can start running your tests locally without even having to have an internet connection to communicate with MailChimp because you're just communicating with the interface that they expose, which you have now mocked using PHP unit. The WordPress testing framework is also a really good place for you to get started if you just want to get your feet wet with unit testing. It is a really intensive way to test WordPress. I'm not sure what the code coverage is right now. It's not covering 100% of the WordPress code base, but we're working really hard to make it so that all new code is covered by unit tests. This is one of the things that led to the impetus of merging the WordPress uh, test framework track with the WordPress core track so that as you, if you see a bug in WordPress and you're writing code to fix the bug, you can also write the unit test to verify that the bug is fixed. Or if you're adding a feature to WordPress, you can write the unit test that makes sure that the feature actually behaves the way it's supposed to be. If you want to give the WordPress test framework a chance, you can. Go ahead and download it. It's open source just like WordPress. 
The only caveat here is because it is testing the WordPress API, and because the WordPress API includes so many direct calls to database queries, you need to have MySQL running, and you need to have a database available for WordPress to do all of its inserts and updates to verify that different parts of the functionality are actually working. Now remember, unless you're writing core code, unless you are writing a patch or a feature for WordPress core, you don't need to use the WordPress test framework. So we're going to go into another example. This one is a little bit less convoluted, and I'm actually going to walk you through how you can build a unit test. So for example, let's say you are running a newspaper. You're running a news site, and you have an SEO expert who tells you, I want all of your titles to be really long and really descriptive so they look right on the home page of the website. But they can only be 40 words long for Google Analytics and for Google SEO. So you're spending all of this time trying to carefully curate 40 word long titles and you can't. To get them to be as descriptive as you need, they're all going to have to be 50 or 60 words long. How do you cut this down and actually put it into your SEO? Well, you decide to create a trim by words function. It's going to take in your content, your title, and then trim it down to a certain number of words so that you can write a title as long as you want. It's always going to cut it down to 40 words, 20 words, 10 words, however many words you want. It doesn't really matter what the content is. This is all you need to write the unit test. Once again, you notice there's no implementation of the code. I'm not actually going to show you how to trim a string down to words because that doesn't really matter for unit testing. You need to know that you're trimming a string. You need to know that it passes in a string, which is your original content, passes in an integer, which is the word count you're going to have, and then it's going to return the trim phrase. That's all you need to know. You can write unit tests even without writing the functionality to verify that this works. Now just remember, when you write these tests, they will fail initially. That's fine. You write a failing test first, then you hand this to a developer, a contractor, somebody you hired, or an intern, whoever you want to have write in your code, and they just have to write enough code to pass your tests. Once they pass the test, you know that the code is actually doing exactly what it is you want it to do. It might not be the most performant code, but we can do with performance optimizations later. Once you write the code that passes the test, you can optimize that code, you can refactor the code to make it faster, to make it more performant, to make it a lighter weight, as long as it still passes the tests. The idea here is to just write the test and get them to pass. So first test is we're going to test that a short sentence is not trimmed. So what if you, you want to trim everything in production to 40 words or less, and you're only writing sentences that are 10 words long? Well, you obviously don't want them to be changed. So in this case, we define our original string is going to be this is a test. And after we trim that, we're going to expect it to be, once again, this is a test. Our result is going to be trimmed by words. We're trimming the original to 99 words or less. I think that's less than 99 words. I, sorry, John, I, I'm not as bad at math, sorry. <laughs> OK, so we're going to assert that our expected string, this is a test, and our result are equal. If you run this and your code is implemented properly, it will pass. You'll get a little green light showing up on your, your dashboard. Everything will work perfectly. That'll be great. Our next test is to verify that long strings are trimmed. So now we've tested short strings are not trimmed. They're left and abused. But now we want to cut off long strings. So in this case, our original string, this is a longer string. We want to trim it down to this is a longer. We're just going to shave off a word. So our result, we're going to call trim by words passing the original string, trim it down to four or less words. Once again, we just prove, we, we tell PHP unit, I want you to prove that these two are equal. If they are, say it passes. If they aren't, give me a failure. Now, we get to the really fun one. And I apologize that this code is shorter and smaller than the other ones, but this is actually using WP mock because I wanted to give a practical example of how WP mock can be used in production. After we've written our function, we pushed it in production, somebody says, wow, I really like this trim by words function, and I, I want to use it on articles, too. We're running a new site, and some of our writers are a little bit too wordy. They're writing articles that are way too long, so I want to just cut off their articles at 300 words. No article should be on our homepage that's longer than 300 words. So I want you to add a filter to WP content to pass trim by words and cut it down to 300 words. So you want to write a test to make sure that that filter has been added to your code. So what you do is you call WP mock, say you're going to expect a filter is going to be added to WP content, 
and the filter is going to be trimmed by words as a priority of 10 and it passes two parameters. You then have some code down here where you say, currently there are zero expected hooks. Now I'm going to use wpmock to make sure that my expected hooks were added. If they weren't, then I'm going to basically record that and say that this, this expected hook was not added. And then I just assert that I, that expected hooks is still empty. So I set up a variable to track how many hooks I've added. I then run to see how many hooks I've added. If I haven't added those hooks, I throw an error and basically say, you did not add this filter to WP content. You're trying to let our writers be too popular on the homepage. Once again, this is WP mock. It's a little bit more advanced than just vanilla PHP unit. It is open source. It's on GitHub. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm always available to discuss it. You can talk to the guy in the corner who helped me write it, John Block. We're both going to be here this weekend if anybody wants to give it a shot while they're here. We'll probably be out in front too. This is just a basic example. It just gives you an idea of how you can actually use WP mock to test certain things like add action and do action without actually using WordPress to call add action or do action. So now I'm going to open it up to some questions. I'm sure there will be some. And once again, I'll be available if anybody doesn't want to ask a question right now, but please ask your questions. I don't know if this microphone works or not. Do you, uh, is this picking up? Yeah. Uh, so when you do these kind of, when you're running these unit tests, do you guys integrate that with any sort of like automated build system or something that you uh, guarantee that these would run like core bad codes check into? So do we integrate this with any sort of a build system? You can, you don't have to. I just take a general practice that I I require other developers I work with to run their unit tests before they actually check in code. And if you check in code and then I pull down your code and I run tests and something fails, you get a phone call and I yell at you for a little bit. But, but the idea is unit tests should be really fast, they should be really simple. If you're writing code, you should be running your unit test suite several times throughout the day. So every time you make a code change, you run your unit test. Every time you add code, you run your unit test. Every time you refactor code, you run your unit test. And if you're doing that and you're disciplined about that, you don't need a continuous integration tool. But there are tools like Travis CI, which does some continuous integration, and will actually run your test every time you push your code to your remote repository. So that is an option. Some projects I'm working on use that, some projects I'm working on don't. It just depends on personal preferences and what resources you have with that. There's a question behind me. Um, so I understand the, uh, the idea of how the tests work, and what I'm curious about, because I've never used PHP unit, is what is the workflow like? Like, where does that function sit? Is there an interface in PHP unit, or do they go in a separate file? How does okay, that... for, for PHP unit, the workflow that I usually take is I have two different projects. So particularly with the theme, I will have the theme will be in its own Git repository, then I'll have the test suite in its own Git repository, and the theme will be a sub-module of that Git repository. So basically, the theme lives in a subfolder of your test project, and then all of your tests are in this separate test project. So that way, you can deploy your theme without having to also deploy your test code, but you can still keep them in the same place on your local machine, so you can run the test repeatedly throughout the day. Any other questions? Okay, if anybody wants them, my slides are available eam.me slash WC boss 2013. Everything is open source. I use the WordPress plugin SEO slides to actually build a presentation. And yeah, if you want a closer look at that, come talk to you later. If there's anybody who has a question that you did not want to ask me on the microphone or in front of the camera, I'll be up here and then I'm going to migrate down over to the, uh, the help bar or whatever it's called at the end. Feel free to come up and say hi, ask your questions. I'm not shy. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day.